Hey everybody, welcome to Extension Monthly. I'm Jennifer Davidson, the County Coordinator here in Russell County with Alabama Cooperative Extension. We're your local access to research-based information, so anything you need to make your life better within your home, your garden, your farm, um, anything like that, you can give us a call here. Our number is 334-298-6845. Um, today we've got a wonderful show for you. We've got you jam, we've got jam-packed information about fall gardening. We're going to talk about the getting ready for the holidays, talk about holiday stress. Um, also, we've got some wonderful information about nutrition and, and making the holidays good for you and your children. But first, we're going to talk about how to sort of manage some pansies and talk about some of the plants that you'll commonly see that you might plant with your fall garden. I know every year when the weather cools off, I get really excited because I'm really glad finally to be able to put some pumpkins outside in my landscape and then also kind of brighten up you know August and September it can can start looking kind of rough around here um, and so I always run out and buy those um, those chrysanthemums because that's usually what catches my eye first in the fall and these are all plants donated to us by John's Lawn and Garden here in Phoenix City and we're so thankful for that these are wonderful wonderful very healthy plants um, but chrysanthemums can be kind of tricky I don't know if they're tricky for you or not they tend to have a very large upper canopy and then a very small pot base. And they grow that pot base in sort of a peat mixture. And if you ever, the trick that I've found is if you ever let these plants dry out, you'll never be able to water them again. And I'm sure many of y'all that have purchased these have had that happen to you. You get it home from the store, it looks wonderful. It's full of even some buds, so it's ready to, to break open. But we tend to be very dry in the month of October. And so you really have to plan to manage this plant. Um, watering can be kind of tricky because a lot of times the canopy is so tight together that you can't, if you water with a water hose, it kind of runs off. So my trick is to, when you water, just kind of separate it, make sure the water goes down in there. Or if you had some sort of a tub, you could actually sit this pot down in there and really get it moist. So keeping that soil moist, but not too wet, um, nicely, evenly moist throughout the month of October will kind of extend that flower life for you. Um, and so, like I said, that, that's one of the disappointments with me when I buy these and then maybe two days later, if we get two 90 degree days with no, no moisture in the air, um, they can dry out really quickly. And then of course you can go buy some more if that happens to you. Um, these plants also can be pl planted in your landscape once you're done and they will perennialize for you. But I will, I will warn you, they're never going to come back up tight like this and blooming at this time of the year. A lot of times what happens is when you plant them in the landscape, they become leggy and they'll bloom a little bit less, um, you know, they just won't be as tight and compact and their blooms won't be quite as prolific on there. So anyway, that's a little bit about these chrysanthemums, beautiful, perfect plants for the fall. Um, we've also got, here's a good example of something that people don't really get too much and that's an oxalis. Um, this one's a purple leafed one. Uh, I love these. These will perennialize. They're bringing a beautiful purple fall color to your landscape. And I'm not in love with these little pink flowers, but that's, all, that's their flower. Um, I, really, I really like the foliage. I like the way the foliage looks. And I think it's a good contrast up against uh, a fall yellow. So there's the, the oxalis. What I wanted to talk with y'all a little bit today, though, is about pansy maintenance. So now's the time of the year that we start kind of getting excited and planting our pansies. And there's so many kinds of pansies. You can, you can pick any color that you want. You can get very large jumbo pansies. Um, also, there are pansies with the face. So it'll have the dark color and the bright color on it. Um, these are the little Johnny Jump Ups, which are actually my favorite kind because they, they typically don't require as much deadheading as the larger pansies, um, but you still want to deadhead pretty much all of your pansies. And what I mean about deadheading is when you've got a flower that's, got, that's gotten kind of over its time, it's, it's kind of reached its prime and it's heading downhill, you can twist that off and just deadhead that out. And what that does is encourage growth. It encourages growth from the interior of the plant and it also encourages more blooming. Um, so if you've got the larger pansy heads, you can really tell when you need to deadhead because a lot of that, that plant, will the, the flowers will kind of be um, twisted and dried out. Um, and then also a trick is once we get to about February, these plant pansies will continue to grow and they'll become very, very leggy. And so what you want to do then is cut those pansies back, 
very heavily and you can just pinch them. You don't even have to use a tool uh, to deadhead a pansy. But in about February, you want to cut those back heavily like this. And then you want to liquid feed them or just add some fertilizer to your bed. Uh, water them well. And then what will happen is that, again, is going to extend the life of this plant later in the season. Now, once it gets to be hot in the spring, they're annuals, so they're going to they're gonna peter out and they won't do, do very well anymore. Um, but by cutting them back and having a fresh flush of growth, they're going to look a lot better a lot longer for you. So that's just a little tip from from that. Another choice of some really, a really good plant to buy in the fall are these ornamental cabbages or kale. Um, you can get them like this with the purple leaf that are fairly um, uh, not curled up or you can get the super, super frilly kind. Any kind, they're wonderful. Um, they do really well. They're, they're nice mixture with the, with the purple leaves or they're also a nice mixture with the, the yellow. Um, they'll last for you all winter long. And um, they're just a great companion plant with, with your winter plants like your pansies or your snapdragons. And they're so easy to maintain, there's really not much to it. Once the bottom leaves get a little bit old looking, you can just kind of cut those off or snap them off. And the plant will just continue to grow. And you kind of know when this plant is done in the spring when it bolts. So if it throws up a flower out of the top of the, of the kale or the cabbage, then that plant, it's done. Um, you wanna just pull that up and start over. So these are just some ideas of, for your win fall and winter garden, your ornamental garden that you might wanna look into. Make sure you cut your pansies back, like I mentioned. Make sure you deadhead them throughout the winter. That's the most important thing. Um, and feel free to give us a look on the web. Our web address, web address is aces.edu. We've got a lot of different publications about um, the maintenance of ornamental plants. One in particular is called Diseases of Pansies and Their Control. Pansies do get some diseases. We get some calls in throughout the winter time. If we have a warm, humid winter like we had last year, hopefully we'll have a cooler one this year, um, but we get a lot of damping off or we can get some crown rot if you've overwatered, that sort of thing. Um, but this publication will let you know how to manage that and work with that. Um, coming up, we've got a wonderful show for you, so stick around. Hey everybody, I'm Sheila Weber. I'm the Family and Child Development Regional Agent for Russell County, and this is my colleague Cynthia. Hi, I'm Cynthia White, Regional Extension Agent for Russell County as well, covering Family Resource Management and Workforce Development. Today we're going to talk to you a little bit about managing holiday stress. Um, everyone knows that our stress levels spike during the holidays. We have expectations from work, from family, from friends, there's so many parties to go to, things to do, there's shopping to do, cooking to do, and we can really get overwhelmed um, with all these new things coming at us that we have to manage. So we're going to talk to you a little bit today on how to handle this stress. I think the main thing that we need to do is manage our expectations. So when we manage our expectations, it basically just means kind of setting boundaries with the people that we're going to be interacting with. Uh, we have to remember that it's okay to say no, and it's okay to say I'm busy or I can't, can't commit to this right now. So I think the first thing that we maybe need to talk about is setting boundaries or managing expectations with our extended families. Exactly. Yeah, our families, we're not having as many children now, but our extended families seem to be larger, you know, and when I say that, I'm thinking about divorce and remarriage, um, stepchildren, step families. So it can be really stressful trying to travel around on the holidays, getting to see everyone. I know that when I got married and started our family, we had to set our holiday schedule as this year we'll be visiting this family, next year we'll be visiting that family. We had to alternate. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, no. setting that expectation with the extended family. All about communication. Exactly. Need to have that conversation so everyone expresses what they feel, what they want. Everyone understands that there are so many demands. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, we can't be everywhere on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or Thanksgiving Day. It's okay to set a date in January or early December to get together and celebrate. Same thing with the financial aspects. Have that conversation and everyone knows maybe Everyone may take a load off and just say, hey, maybe we'll do dinner or lunch in January. We don't necessarily have to exchange gifts, a gift for each individual person. Just all about communication, planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think another important thing is to set your expectations with your nuclear family, with the family that you live with. Exactly. Um, 
I know I enjoy the holidays much more when it's slower and more relaxed and I'm able to sit there and actually enjoy the time with my family and um, really get what the holidays are about. Exactly. It's an opportunity to teach everyone, especially your children, that it's not always about those monetary gifts. Sometimes you just need to, to rejoice in the, the real meaning of the season. Maybe do some scrapbooking, you know, and, and instead of a monetary gift or a tangible items. Right. Just yeah, there's always opportunities within the community too to give back. Um, I think that's a great lesson for your children to teach them that it's really not always about them and what they receive, that the real joy is giving back. Exactly. Yeah. Do charity. Maybe uh, make a donation in someone's name. Maybe go do some community service mm -hmm. and, and help some people that are less fortunate that aren't going to be able to do any type of gift exchange. Right, exactly. And, and you know, one way to kill two birds with one stone is to... Um, adopt a child in the community to shop for. Yes. You can give your child a budget where they can go shopping and learn that giving is better than receiving, but they also learn how to manage that money. Exactly. Yeah. Very valuable lesson both ways. Mm -hmm. So I think, and the third thing we want to talk about are the expectations of yourself. Yes, we, we put a little more on, we tend to put a little more on ourselves by thinking that we have to buy everyone these expensive gifts that we have to buy. We think, oh, my, my mom, she's done so much. I need to buy her this large item when it's not necessarily about the amount of money. And if we just sit down and plan, set a budget, look at each individual that we're going to spend for and decide how much we are willing to spend for that person or able to spend it for that person. Maybe the first time you go out to do your shopping, don't buy anything that time. Make sure when you do shop, don't take your credit cards with you. Make sure that you understand that, hey, I can't do those spur of the moment purchases because they tend to go over budget easily. Um, you think, hey, I see this item, I like it. We get caught up in the marketing of the item and forget about our budget. Planning, have to plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that um, we also feel the pressure to give gifts as good as the ones that we receive. But I've learned that comparison is the thief of joy. Yes. Yeah. Quickly, if, you, if you're measuring what you're giving, you know, always wanting to give the best gift, then a lot of times uh, you, you don't get a lot of joy out of that. Exactly. You're giving into the pressure. Exactly. Um, I think most of all, just give yourself a little grace and know that it's okay to, um, to set boundaries and to, uh, to tell people no, that you, you can't maybe commit to these things. You have to understand that we have to be able to live beyond that season. You know, January is coming, February is coming, and we're going to have to be able to pay our bills and manage our expenses. And if we've overspent during that time, during that holiday season, then everything is out of hand. Exactly. I think a lot of people spend next year's money oh, yes. on this, this month's gifts. Yes. And when you were talking about the comparing items, I thought about when, when the children are opening gifts, it'd be great if you kind of let each child open one gift at a time, pass that around, give it an opportunity for everyone to ooh and ah over that particular gift right. where everyone isn't looking at the other person's gift and saying, oh, this is what I have, but they have this. Everyone just looks at one gift at a time. No one's able to compare, and that helps. That's a great idea. Yeah. Cynthia and I have worked to make a, an article for our newsletter, the Extension newsletter. If you're interested in receiving the newsletter, you can call 334-298-6845. Hello, this is Helen Jones with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System uh, here in Russell County. And today I have with me Velma Dowdell. She's also um, agent assistant with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. And we both do nutrition education programs here in the Russell County area. And today we just want to talk about holidays, uh, treats for kids, uh, for Halloween, for Thanksgiving, for Christmas. Uh, and we're also going to make a little dish, parfait. a parfait we're dish. Making a parfait. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the parfait we're going to make today. Well, in today's world, we know that we're busy and things are hectic. So the easiest thing to do is to make something that's nutritious and not so fattening. So we're using fruit. And with Halloween, we chose the um, little um, halo oranges or the, what's the other brand? Tangerines. Tangerines and the pineapple and then I got these um, kiwi and strawberries because it's the Christmas colors it's red and green and all you do is you top it with 
vanilla yogurt. And it's so easy and it's sweet and it's good and the kids usually love it. And it's really pretty to look at. And that's a, you know, that's a good healthy treat. This is a good healthy treat and it's also attractive on the table. So you just cut your fruit up, make your colors and top it with vanilla yogurt. Yogurt is a, a little bit better than the um, the cream cheese fruit dip. So we like for you to use yogurt because that's not as fattening as the cream cheese. But this is just plain vanilla yo play yogurt, the light brand. Okay. Um, also, you know, a lot of times if you do fruit instead of candy, that'll cut back on some of the the um, sugar content because children themselves don't need to eat too much. Um, sugar, they need to eat a lot of more fruits and vegetables. The uh, CDC reported last year that the childhood obesity rate in the United States had leveled off in recent years. Uh, but great news, still the proportion of American kids who are obese is still amazingly high. Uh, 10 to 0.4 percent of those ages between two and five and 19.6 percent of those in the prime trick-or-treat years of six years to 11 years. So basically eating you know fresh fruit could cut back on some of the sugar content but you know fresh fruit do has its has its own sugar natural, sugar, natural sugar in it so it's not that added sugars that children will will get. Um, and you know, statistics always show that fresh fruits and vegetables are healthier for children than the other junk food that they enjoy eating, okay. processed food. Okay. Um, some of the other things that we do in Extension, we also do uh, food demonstrations showing young adults and children too how to prepare healthy snacks and also healthy meals. Um, here in um, Russell County, what are some of the things that you do in the school system with some of the kids? We have a program called Body Quest that runs about 17 weeks that we do, and I'm at Meadow Lane and Westview this, this year. And in Lee County, I'm at Beauregard Elementary, and um, the kids receive it very well, and um, they learn the five food groups and how to eat healthy. Okay. Uh, and another good way um, I learned from Velma is that like f to add more vegetables to children's diet is she has a recipe uh, in doing spaghetti and I've tried it at home. You actually, you know, make your spaghetti like you usually do, but when you get ready to do your sauce, you can add some fresh zucchini in it. Just cut it up into small pieces and put it into your uh, spaghetti sauce and then put it with your um, spaghetti and you can actually bake it mm -hmm. for we about. call it uh, skillet spaghetti or spaghetti bake. Mm -hmm. And um, some people just leave it in the skillet and you top it with the cheese, mozzarella cheese. But um, I call it hiding the vegetables and um, you just chop the zucchini up really fine and you put it in your spaghetti. And usually the kids think it's just part of the meat. But um, <laughs> that's a way to sneak in a vegetable in your spaghetti. <laughs> So that's just another way of trying to, you know, increase, the increase your vegetable consumption mm -hmm. because, you know, with the dietary guidelines, one of the things that they want us to do is to increase our vegetable and fruit consumption in our diet each day because we need to increase our fiber and you get your fiber from a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. Yep. Hi, I'm Janet with Russell County Extension and I'm here today to give you a few food safety holiday tips. Well, first, you want to make sure that you start off with a plan. Plan your menu, and when you plan your menu, think about your space. How much stove space do you have? How much refrigerator space do you have for not only cooking, but storing the food after you've prepared it? Then, when it comes to shopping, take your shopping list, Plan out your menu, get all the items on your shopping list, and make sure you even travel through the grocery store with time and temperature in mind. Make sure you get the non-perishables first, because they don't need time and temperature control, and then get those cold items last. Now, since we're talking the holidays, we're talking turkeys, hams, and a lot of times your turkeys may be bought frozen. Now you do have to consider that you have to have time to thaw it. If you're getting a 10 to 12 pound turkey, you're gonna need at least 
a day for each five pounds. So you're going to have to make sure you're thawing it in your refrigerator. So if you got a 10 pound turkey, you're looking at two to three days. And you want to make sure you're thawing it on the bottom shelf on a tray or a container to make sure no juices drip down. If you don't have time to go through the thawing, then go ahead and buy a fresh turkey. But make sure you get it home in a couple of hours um, so that it doesn't get, you know, start spoiling or anything. Then once you get home, get ready to prepare it. Do, there are some items that you can cook ahead of time and store them. If you're doing any baked goods, you can do those ahead of time. Some salads and things like that can be prepared ahead and refrigerated. But again, check refrigerated space. When it comes to your turkey, um, like I said, if you're using fresh, go ahead, keep it in the fridge until you prepare it. Make sure you're cooking it in a warm oven. You want to make sure you're cooking that turkey at no lower than 350 degrees. Follow guidelines. If you're not sure about proper cooking, you can always go to the USDA website and do the Ask Karen icon. She can give you tips on proper cooking. But you want to always cook your turkey to at least 165 degrees. Now we'll talk about stuffing. Some people do stuffing inside the bird. Some people do stuffing outside the bird. If you do stuffing inside the bird, it also must reach an internal temperature of 165 degrees. So in order to know that, you've got to use a thermometer. So make sure you have a good thermometer to check the temperature of that turkey. Um, another thing is, when you're doing your fresh vegetables, make sure that you're washing them just before you prepare them. Because if you wash them and put them in the fridge, they can go bad a little bit quicker. So always do them just before you're going to prepare. Make sure all your surfaces are cleaned and sanitized, and that includes your hands. Make sure you wash your hands properly so that you don't contaminate the food items yourself. Another thing that you want to do if you're doing juices, sometimes you'll do that good old apple cider or eggnog during the holidays. Make sure that you are pasteurizing those products or using pasteurized products, especially to your eggs. And if you're using eggs in any other dishes, make sure that they're fully cooked so that they don't cause contamination of other products. Then one of the other things that you're going to also need to do during the holidays, we always have a lot of family, friends around, we're entertaining. Make sure that anybody that's going to come into the kitchen, help you prepare, or this there for tasting, make sure that they also properly wash their hands because they are out there doing a lot of different things. So we don't want to make anybody sick during our happy holiday time. And then once you have enjoyed those wonderful meals, then, you know, we're either watching football games, singing carols, and we may forget that the food's still sitting out on the table. Well, we want to make sure that we separate the food into smaller containers with the turkey. Make sure you take the meat off the bone, put it in shallow containers, and get it into the refrigerator within a couple of hours, generally no more than two. And then when it's time to enjoy the meal all over again, Make sure that hot foods are reheated to 165 degrees. Make sure that cold foods are kept at 41 degrees. And enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Thanks so much for watching Extension Monthly. I'm Jennifer Davidson, the county coordinator here, coordinator here with Russell County Extension. I want to thank so much um, John's Lawn and Garden here in Phoenix City for donating these plants for us to talk about uh, fall plant maintenance. Um, before we go though, I've got some wonderful events that are coming up. Fun event that you might want to jot down on your calendar on December 13th from 5 to 7. We're going to have cookies with Santa here at your county extension office. And again, we're located at 508 14th Street. Um, so if you'd like to come to that, jot your calendar, jot it down on your calendar and give us a call. Our number is 334-298-6845. You can check us online at, on Facebook, Twitter. Um, or you can look at our website, which is at aces.edu, Russell. Again, thank you so much for watching Extension Monthly.